Madhu, please start. Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to the certificate course in personality development imprint jointly organized by Manohar Rao Kamadi Mahavidyale, Rajkumar Kevalramani Kanya Mahavidyale, Hislop College, JM Patel College, Bandara, and RS Mundle Dharampet College of Arts and Commerce. To conduct today's session, we are fortunate to have among us Dr. Shripad Bhatt from the University of Manipal. Sir is working as Dean, Faculty of Languages and Literature and Head, Department of English. Recently, he has completed research project entitled Cultural Studies, Theory and Methodology. Many national international research paper publications, books are to his credit. He is an honorable member of many prestigious institutions in India and abroad. He is a visiting professor to Memorial University, Canada, and delivered a number of lectures in different universities. He has contributed to Karnataka theater also. Today, sir will enlighten us on the topic, Shakespeare's criticism. It is an humble request to Dr. Shripad Bhatt to take it further. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Madhavi. I hope I'm audible, right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the title of my presentation today is Trends in Shakespeare Criticism. So let me share the presentation with you here. So this is the, the title of my presentation, as I told you. It's about Shakespeare criticism, how Shakespeare has been viewed across ages, right since the time uh, when he wrote all those wonderful plays. So how he was viewed by his contemporaries and how he is, he is being viewed by our contemporaries. So there is a uh, uh, time span of around 400 years, how Shakespeare has been viewed, understood and perceived through the prism of their own times. That is the focal point of my presentation today. So uh, the bottom line is simple. Every age creates its own Shakespeare. It's true when Shakespeare was alive, when Shakespeare was presenting the plays. And it is also true even today. Every age creates its own Shakespeare. So Shakespeare here becomes the mirror, the mirror through which he is perceived. And his plays and characters uh, are like a portrait whose eyes seem to follow you around the room. I'm sure some of the participants here have uh, visited Mysore and during that time they must have visited the famous uh, uh, gallery there uh, in in Jagan Mohan Palace. There is a beautiful portrait of lady with a lamp. It's not Florence Nightingale. It's it's a portrait of Indian lady holding a lamp. And there we know that, you know, wherever we move in that room, in that small enclosure, we feel as if she is following us. And, you know, that is appropriate when it comes to Shakespeare. His plays and characters are like a portrait whose eyes seem to follow you around the room. And uh, it is also true that the ultimate yardstick for any new school of criticism to signal its arrival and test its theoretical and methodological tools. So Shakespeare has become the, the final yardstick. So whenever a new school of criticism appears on the scene, whether it is feminism or post-colonialism or formalism, it doesn't matter. Their ultimate test, their litmus test would be Shakespeare. How would they approach Shakespeare? It depends upon, you know, there it, you know, there it lies, you know, the, the credibility of their entire approach. Uh, let us see how Shakespeare was perceived by his own contemporaries. How, in other words, how the Elizabethans looked at Shakespeare. Let's be very honest about it. 
the the kind of uh, you know pomp the kind of uh, 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 euphoria the kind of glory surrounding shakespeare today was conspicuous by its absence during his time but that doesn't mean that he was uh, unpopular absolutely not shakespeare was the most popular uh, 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 playwright of his times he was perceived as a great entertainer and let's be very honest about it he delivered several blockbusters he, therefore he became very very popular during his own time and he could reach both the elites and masses with with remarkable felicity that was the genius of shakespeare he could reach the the masses and he could also reach the elites and therefore shakespeare became indispensable component of popular culture and imagination now today you think of somebody in in hollywood like like uh, uh, you know uh, quentin tarantino or or any other blockbuster maker that was shakespeare for you and people would wait for his play to appear on stage and and they would applaud him and therefore he was the most popular playwright of his time and hence he became the indispensable component of popular culture and imagination and how he was perceived by by his contemporaries particularly his peers uh there was one gentleman his name was francis marish so in 1598 he declared shakespeare to be england's england's greatest writer in comedy and tragedy and there was another poet his name was john weaver he lauded honey tongued shakespeare that was the title given to shakespeare by uh, another contemporary and during this period you will see the the you know beginnings of shakespeare criticism it was not well structured the way it is today that happens much later but uh, some of his contemporaries who were also critics like ben johnson he lauded shakespeare you are all you know famous with you know you are all familiar with the, the famous utterance of ben johnson about shakespeare who uh, 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 who once said he was not for an age but for all time he was not of an age but for all time that was ben johnson for you lording shakespeare and he also described shakespearean plays as a monument without a tomb and what is he trying to say is this he is trying to uh, foreground the timelessness of shakespeare shakespeare does not belong to our times his plays have universal appeal so he belongs to all ages his characters they belong to they do not belong to our times they belong to all ages and therefore he would be relevant in all times that's what ben johnson was trying to say and it has uh, 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 come true but he was critical of shakespeare for lacking refinement and also for flouting uh, classical rules so uh ben johnson was grumpy about shakespeare not adhering to the the aristotelian you know uh, uh uh unity of action time and place well you all know that to prove him wrong shakespeare wrote one final play and and that is the tempest that was his song song and and after writing this play he he says goodbye to london stage and goes back to his village so uh he was also capable you know but he did it deliberately because he was a genius he never bothered about all these uh, you know uh, uh uh restrictive and conservative uh, classical rules now let's come to the 17th century in the 17th century you will see uh, uh great poets like and poets as well as critics like john dryden and alexander pope they also revered shakespeare and uh here you will see a definite pattern there is a visible appreciation followed by criticism culminating in a final final burst of applause yes they appreciate no doubt about it but it is it is uh, tinged with some kind of criticism mainly on on the ground that 
he flouted the classical rules. That's only, you know, uh, uh, grounds against Shakespeare. When it comes to the 17th century uh, critics, nevertheless, they, they hailed him as English Homer. John Dryden, for instance, who, who, who considered Shakespeare a native genius gifted with imagination, but he also said uh, Shakespeare lacked decorum and judgment. You know, these were all uh, great classical scholars. They were trained in uh, Latin and Greek, ancient, you know, ancient Greek language. And therefore, they, they uh, 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 use the yardsticks borrowed from classical criticism while, while coming to grips with the, the plays written by Shakespeare. That's it. So they indeed appreciate it, no doubt about it. But at the same time, they were uncomfortable about the fact that Shakespeare did not adhere to certain classical principles that therefore they said he lacked decorum and judgment. So the point is simple. Shakespeare, when it comes to these critics from the 17th century, he is seen through the prism of neoclassicism. Now, let's come to the 18th century England. Uh, there is a perceptible continuity of the same neoclassical trajectory when it comes to Shakespeare. Veneration followed by a tinge of criticism. Uh, Alexander Pope, he is also a great uh, uh, admirer of Shakespeare's plays. And he says that Shakespeare deserves greater reverence, but some segments seem childish ill-placed and unequal to its grandeur. That is his observation. Now, there was another great uh, 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 critic, Samuel Johnson, who is perhaps the greatest critic of the 18th century England. He offers a more nuanced and balanced view of Shakespeare. And, and uh, uh, he would rather say, you know, the beginning of serious Shakespeare criticism happens when Samuel Johnson starts writing about Shakespeare. So there you will find the, the authentic beginnings of Shakespeare criticism. Now, let's come to the 19th century. Here, in the 19th century, Shakespeare becomes an icon of British national culture. Remember, right since the time Shakespeare wrote up to the 19th century, Shakespeare was considered as a great playwright, albeit some, some deficiencies. But he was confined to the realm of uh, drama. That's it. But for the first time, Shakespeare becomes a supreme icon. And for the first time, Shakespeare gets institutionalized. And, and it happens at a time when English literature emerges uh, as as a, a structured discourse. Remember, there was nothing called English literature. You know, today we have uh, we have uh, uh, acquired degrees in English literature. Now these things were unheard of because because there was no discipline called English literature. It happens sometime in the 19th century, maybe at the beginning. In the, in the early decades of the 19th century. In other words, English literature uh, gets institutionalized during this particular period. And it also coincides with uh, the emergence of English as an imperial power. During, during the 19th century, England witnessed unprecedented power and glory. And during this particular time, Shakespeare is integrated as the supreme canon of English literature. And it doesn't stop here. Shakespeare becomes a brand. He becomes the brand ambassador of the, the, the imperial England, the British Empire. And therefore, Shakespeare is packaged and sealed. Uh, and then he is sent to the colonies as part of the civilizing mission. You have heard of the, the uh, uh, notorious white man's burden. So they had a mission, mission to civilize, quote and unquote, civilize the whole world. And as part of it, they introduced English education in various colonies. 
and those who are familiar with the 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 history of uh, colonial india you all know that english as a subject uh, was introduced particularly in the in the today's metropolitan locations like kolkata mumbai and chennai and there english was taught as a, a language and shakespeare was part of it shakespeare and wordsworth they were all part of it so english uh, shakespeare becomes the part of uh, uh, english curriculum which was which never happened in the earlier times so this period 19th century you will see this period romancing shakespeare shakespeare is uh, is uh, kept on a high pedestal so to speak and one of the great critics of the 19th century samuel coleridge he hailed shakespeare as a great organic genius gifted with spontaneity so coleridge was all praised when it came to shakespeare and and, and there was nothing but awe and reverence when it came to shakespeare as far as coleridge was concerned and his contemporary a great poet wordsworth he came out with a wonderful statement particularly in the context of uh, shakespeare's sonnets you know until the 19th century shakespeare's sonnets they, they they never deserved that kind of critical scrutiny however that was given by the 19th century uh, critics particularly wordsworth so shakespeare uh, uh, wordsworth praised shakespeare's sonnets on the ground that you know in these sonnets according to him shakespeare unlocked his heart what a beautiful metaphor so he he unlocked his heart he gave expression to his emotions and feelings and remember this is uh, uh, you know uh, rather uh, uh, it it synchronizes well with uh, uh, his works and another one thomas de quincey created the larger than life image of shakespeare so branding of shakespeare happens in the 19th century so this is a very crucial period when it comes to shakespeare criticism now let's move on to the early part of the 20th century and in the early decades of the 20th century you will witness the arrival of another great critic his name is ac bradley i'm sure all of you who are present here uh, familiar with the, his uh, magnum opus titled shakespearean tragedy which appeared uh, in 1904 and this particular work it radically altered the narrative of shakespeare criticism by foregrounding the character analysis so the focal point of uh, uh, bradleyan uh, analysis happens to be the tragic heroes whether it is hamlet or macbeth or Othello or King Lear. So, uh, according to him, in these plays, particularly in these great tragedies, uh, we will find grand un unfolding of the conflict between the hero and the universe. So, it is an epic battle, so to speak, between the hero, the protagonist, whether it is Macbeth or Othello, and a universe. So, uh, what happens in this battle? Ultimately, the the man loses, not because he's uh, he's inglorious, but because he's consumed by his own tragic flaw. Now, here he highlighted the tragic flaw of Macbeth as vaulting ambition, or in the case of Hamlet, Bradley said what ultimately consumed Hamlet was his, uh, uh, you know. Uh, procrastinating tendency. So this was AC Bradley for you. And what we find in Bradleyan criticism is an exposition of essential humanism and individualism on an epic scale. So it gave a new turn, a paradigm shift, let us say, to uh, uh, Shakespeare criticism. Now, uh, in the in the, hello could you please uh, put off the mic yeah so in the in the third and fourth decades of the 20th century you will find the arrival of formalist criticism 
across uh, uh, you know uh, both in england and also in the united states so you will come across great critics like f r lewis l c knights g wilson knight and and they came out with a new strategy of reading reading shakespeare and what was it which is it is known as a close reading of the text and this this method of reading was developed by i richards and it was it was uh, uh, used effectively by the likes of f r lewis l c knights and g wilson knight and they came out with the, a wonderful analysis of shakespearean plays you know i still remember during my ma days uh, carrying uh, the the famous work of g wilson knight titled the wheels of fire even today it's one of the best works on uh, shakespeare and uh, so uh, what did they do these formalists uh, they completely glossed over the historical background by focusing on language tone imagery and rhythm so that was their focal point and that is also true of uh, wilson knight's famous book uh, the wheels of fire and in 1964 another critic emerged you know he is not a famous critic i'm sure most of you haven't heard of his name his name is ian cot but his book shakespeare our contemporary it is one of the best works on shakespeare in the 20th century shakespeare and it has been translated into several uh, several european as well as uh, uh indian languages the title of the book is shakespeare our contemporary and in this work he makes an existential and absurdist reading of shakespeare remember this is the time which has seen the works of let us say albert camus zappa sartre and the plays of samuel beckett who who highlighted the absurdist nature of human life and the same principles are applied uh to the works of shakespeare and shakespeare is read through the prism of existentialism and absurdism well slowly you know you will see the change in tide until this period let us say until mid 1950s you will see uh, uh, a kind of veneration a kind of glorification of shakespeare uh but post 1950s onwards there is a new trend kind of tendency a new kind of uh, you know uh, a new way of looking at shakespeare so to speak and uh, critiquing the canon becomes the the byword so here shakespeare is is uh, uh, appreciated no doubt about it but he is also scrutinized by various angles uh or through various angles by by critics belonging to different schools of thought so if, during this period you will see the arrival of post structuralist theories and here as i told you earlier veneration is replaced by critical scrutiny what are these critics doing now whether it is uh, uh, whether it is post colonial or feminist or marxist therefore grounding historical linguistic and psychoanalytical perspective and by doing so they are rejecting the earlier earlier critical schools or the, the earlier methods which were uh, by and large essentialist humanist and idealistic interpretations of uh, shakespeare whether it is by bradley or coleridge or samuel johnson you know there is a tendency to idealize and to essentialize the 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 characters and the the uh, works of shakespeare now that is that is being challenged and more importantly when it comes to uh, post structuralist criticism you will see that uh, there is a constant shifting of boundaries so what is constant here is shifting of boundaries you know various perspectives are brought in and i will make it very clear to you in the uh uh next slides let's go to marxist shakespeare how marxist critics of the 20th century have viewed shakespeare now their focal point as usual is the elizabethan age because the 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 narrative of marxist criticism is anchored in historicizing a writer or historicizing a text 
so in keeping with the the, the uh, classical trend of marxist criticism most of uh, marxist critics uh, they focus on historicizing shakespearean works and they don't stop there they also historicize the reader you or me how do we read shakespeare today and as part of it you know new new uh, uh, new works have emerged within within the terrain of marxist criticism and there is a a, a branch of marxist criticism which is known as a cultural criticism it examines how shakespeare's plays mediate elizabethan ideology this is very important according to them the the works of shakespeare most of the works of shakespeare they in one way or the other they uphold and mediate the elizabethan ideology and what is the dominant ide elizabethan ideology they speak of they are speaking about the monarchic ideology remember during shakespearean time of course uh, queen elizabeth was a, uh, was reigning at that time and and remember you know it was uh, uh, it was not a settled age so to speak there were challenges within there were contradictions within and and monarchy was slowly settling down in england and and uh, um, according to these critics particularly cultural cultural materialists like dolly moore and sinfield these plays of shakespeare in one way or the other try to consolidate and and mediate the elizabethan monarchic ideology the best example would be their analysis of macbeth see what happens in macbeth the Mac, the play begins with the assassination of the king the legitimate king duncan by macbeth and lady macbeth the the insidious couple and uh, macbeth usurps the throne and he becomes the king and ironically see how the play comes to an end it comes to an end with the killing of the king when macbeth is killed he is the king remember that but his killing is considered to be legitimate whereas the killing of duncan is considered to be illegitimate because duncan is a legitimate king you cannot kill a legitimate king you cannot challenge a legitimate power a monarch and therefore anybody who does that deserves punishment and symbolically the punish punishment is meted out uh, by none other than malcolm the future king the prince so this not this is nothing but legitimization of monarchic ideology so only a prince can succeed the king and prince happens to be the son of the king only the son of the king can succeed him and no other person can aspire to the throne so this is how dalimore and sinfield analyze the the play of shakespeare so uh, uh, you please read his work political shakespeare okay you can get uh, e version of this book if you google it it's a beautiful work and there is one more book by uh, john drakakis titled alternative shakespeare's so how shakespeare is uh, looked at for, you know from different angles by different literary critics of uh, contemporary times and another interesting book is uh, william shakespeare by terry eagleton a beautiful book very you know polemical and it makes a very interesting reading and you have new historicism which was which which came up in the united states and the pioneer of new historicism is stephen greenblatt he too has uh, contributed significantly to shakespearean criticism so his approach is you know very simple uh, he just juxtaposes uh, you know some contemporary uh, 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 piece of uh, text and then he goes back to shakespeare 
So in a way, his method is unconventional, so to speak, and and so thereby, you know, he he juxtaposes the contemporary world with the Elizabethan world, and and comes out with an insightful analysis of Shakespeare. Now, let us see how uh, feminist critics have approached Shakespeare. So, feminist critics by and large consider Shakespeare uh, as an upholder of patriarchal ideology. That doesn't mean that you know they are they are going to reject Shakespeare. No, because they know that it was not you know it was a historical folly. Shakespeare was part of Elizabethan age, and we call him the child of the Elizabethan age. But they never you know they never shy away from from uh, highlighting the fact that in one way or the other Shakespearean plays uh, are the vehicles of patriarchal ideology. And therefore, they call Shakespeare the patriarchal bard. Feminist criticism, therefore, eliminates the extent to which Shakespeare inhabited the patriarchal world dominated by men and fathers, in which women were essentially the means of exchange in power relationship. So that is patriarchy for you. And these critics, they are interested in marriage, gender relations, and power. And they particularly focus on the dominating role of father in the tempest. So it is Prospero who, who decides everything for, for his daughter. So uh, when it comes to his daughter, Miranda, you feel as if you know she is deprived of her agency, so to speak because she is not the one who is going to decide about her her companion her husband everything is decided by the dominer the the domineering father that is prospero okay so uh, that way uh, feminist critical law are critical of this aspect of shakespeare and they compare Romeo's macho male loyalties with the gentle and forgiving model of Juliet. Here, I would uh, uh, mention a couple of works, uh, beautiful works on Shakespeare, uh, uh, as far as a feminist approach is concerned. Uh, one is Shakespeare and the Nature of Women by Juliet Duesenberg. It's a beautiful work, which came in 1975. Then you have uh, Lisa Jardin in 1983. She came out with a beautiful work titled Still Harping on Daughters. So these two are important works on Shakespeare by feminist critics. Now, let's come to late 80s or early part of the 20th century. During this period, you will see the arrival of deconstruction, the read of deconstruction, even though their contribution is minimal when it comes to Shakespeare criticism, nevertheless, they, you know, did uh, uh, make certain observations about Shakespeare. So uh, what is a USP of uh, deconstruction when it comes to Shakespeare? Deconstruction resists effort by the traditional critic to produce any unified text of Shakespearean play. So they say, Shakespearean texts, you know, as argued by 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 the traditional critics, the traditional critics would argue whether it is A.C. Bradley or 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 uh, uh, L.J. Uh, you know Wilson Knight that Shakespearean works are unified texts. So there is unity behind apparent disunity. Deconstructionists. On the other hand, argue that there is disunity behind apparent unity. So they focus on the the uh, uh, you can see uh, disunified aspect of Shakespeare, and Terence Hawkes challenges the tyrannical boundaries laid by traditional literary critics when it comes to Shakespeare. So, according to him. His works do not have boundaries. You can enter the text wherever you want. 
whenever you want. So there are no entry points. There are no exit points. So a text becomes a fluid entity. I mean, it is also true of all the texts when it comes to deconstruction is, but specifically in the context of Shakespeare, they argue that there are no boundaries when it comes to Shakespearean plays. So, uh, according to me, the only significant book on this area produced by any, any significant or any authentic deconstructionist is uh, Shakespeare and deconstruction by Douglas Atkins and David Bergson, uh, Bergeron. It will it came in 1988. So this is the only work where you will find the application of deconstruction when it comes to Shakespeare. Uh, well, deconstructionist criticism has its own uh, uh, challenges, has its own issues when it comes to Shakespeare. And therefore, according to some critics, deconstructive reading of Shakespeare suffers from willful obscurity. It's also true of their reading of other works also. There is, you know, willful obscurity is a, is a kind of, uh, 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 you can call it the USP of deconstructionist criticism. And therefore, um, deconstructionist approach to Shakespeare hasn't produced any significant work. Now, let's come to the most interesting uh, school of criticism, which has come out with a wonderful reading of, you know, rather say controversial also reading of Shakespeare. So here, post-colonial approach to Shakespeare foregrounds uh, histories of peoples and cultures outside the traditional Anglo-American scholarly world. So these critics, they have come from outside the, the Anglo-American world. You know, most of the critics whom we discussed so far they are either from England or mostly from England or from the United States. But the post-colonial critics, they have come from different parts of the world, particularly the, the colonized or the post-colonial world. So when it comes to post-colonial approach to Shakespeare, you'll find a paradigm shift. So here, Shakespeare has become a fractured, discursive field premised on the history of colonial domination by the white race. So here, Shakespeare is seen as a white or Anglo-Saxon writer. And therefore, his characters, <coughs> particularly characters belong, belonging to other races, whether it is Shylock in Merchant of Venice, or whether it is Caliban in, in The Tempest, they are you know, the focal point of post-colonial critics. And therefore, they challenge the canonical Shakespeare. And like their post-structuralist contemporaries, they reject essentialism and idealism built into Shakespearean criticism. So what is the USP of, of post-colonial criticism when it comes to Shakespeare? It is simple. They interrogate race and nationhood built into the texture of Shakespearean plays, <clears throat> whether it is Macbeth or whether it is Midsummer Night's nice Dream, doesn't matter. So according to them, uh, Shakespeare plays an important role uh, as, an, as an instrument of a colonial power. You know, as I told you earlier, 19th, 18th or 19th century onwards, England grew up, grew exponentially as a supreme imperial power. And Shakespeare became part of that colonial or imperial ideology because Shakespeare was disseminated uh, uh, in the English speaking world as part of their so called civilizing mission. And therefore, uh, uh, modern post-colonial critics take exception to the fact that Shakespearean's plays are used as an instrument of colonial power. And uh, Ania Lomba, she is a well-known uh, Indian critic, post-colonial critic, and, and she has spoken about the spread of Shakespearean pedagogy in India, how Shakespeare was spread across India uh, right since 
the 19th century. So according to these post-colonial critics, these uh, classical British critics, they created the myth of universal bard. Okay, Shakespeare belongs to all ages. And, and according to them, it is nothing but a myth. It's not true at all. And uh, there is a tendency, according to them, to erase the blackness of Othello. You know, Othello is a moor, a black warrior. And, and uh, when, he, when uh, the play is staged, you know, there is no focus on no? the blackness of Othello. Because when uh, a white man or a blue-blooded Anglo-Saxon assumes the role of Othello on the stage, obviously, it, it leads to the erasure of his blackness. And post-colonial critics are highly critical of this aspect of, you know, uh, uh, traditional approach to Shakespeare. And they they consider Prospero as a blue-blooded colonizer, a card-carrying colonizer, so to speak, who, who goes to uh, an island, who occupies it, and, and, and uh, subjugates the, the the natives there, and the natives are represented by uh, Caliban. Okay, so who is who is projected as a symbol of uh, uh, violence, a symbol of you know uh, you could say um, um, savagery, so to speak, right? So um, in a way, you know these post-colonial critics and they face a kind of dilemma they have to speak about shakespeare right they cannot wish him away because he is very much part of their world but at the same time while speaking about shakespeare indirectly or you know consciously or under unconsciously they're privileging shakespeare's text right the very fact that you're talking endlessly about shakespeare shows that you are assigning too much of importance to shakespeare so this is a dilemma faced by modern uh, post-colonial critics, okay? So this dilemma still continues. Now, let me conclude. I have taken better part of 45 minutes and uh, the remaining 15 minutes, you know, I would like to look forward to your comments and your observations, okay? So um, let me make it very clear to you. Shakespeare, you know, there are, Tons of books on Shakespeare, uh, hundreds of thousands of books, and and he's still not exhausted. Even today, people are writing about uh, Shakespeare. So the rich diversity of Shakespeare criticism is due to Shakespeare's intuitive ability to come to grips with and articulate the complex riddles, contradictions, and emotions of human world in an idiom invented by the bard himself. So why Shakespeare is read even today, even though we we are separated from him uh, for about 400 years or, you know, he lived 10,000 miles away. Nevertheless, we, we appreciate it's part of our, uh, our imagination, our literary imagination. And everyone who is interested in Shakespeare, who is interested in literature, knows about Shakespeare because Shakespeare has been translated practically into all languages. In Indian context, he is practically translated into all Indian languages. And therefore, you know, he's appreciated, he's read even today. And the reason, as I told you, Shakespeare is capable of articulating the complex riddles, contradictions, and emotions built into the human world. That is also true of our great Indian epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata. So Ramayana and Mahabharata are, you know, they are read in each and every way, age, you know, even though they were written um, uh, uh, more than 2000 years ago, they're alive because they're part of the collective imagination of all the Indians. So even today, somebody would come out with a rereading of Mahabharata. And it would happen in the next century also. And it is also true of Shakespeare because Shakespeare had this ability 
to to come to grips with the, the complex dynamics of human emotions whether it is uh, a hamlet or ophelia or desdemona or othello once uh, our uh, our former prime minister nehru in the parliament quipped there is you know i feel like hamlet and here hamlet symbolizes the 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 uh, eternal dilemma faced by mankind to be or not to be i enjoy ha reading hamlet even today because there is hamlet within me and shakespeare has given expression to this hamlet and more importantly you know why shakespeare is read why shakespeare is relevant even today i would like to you know look at it from the famous uh, uh, quote of d h lawrence uh, 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 let me tell you very clearly d h lawrence did not make this statement in the context of shakespeare it was a general statement about literature as a whole but it is specifically true in the case of shakespeare so what did he what did he say about uh, literature he said the the greatness of any writer is not projecting the diamond as it is but to see the carbon beneath the diamond i repeat the great writer's ability lies in his you know lies in looking beneath the car you know beneath the diamond to see the carbon beneath the diamond what does he mean by it yes all of you know we are we are enamored by we are mesmerized by the dazzling shades of diamond shakespeare's works the dazzle okay every time every time you go back to shakespeare you will come out with a new meaning of shakespeare that is the dazzling nature of shakespeare but remember a diamond is nothing but a compressed carbon so millions of years ago carbon was put under tremendous pressure and it was converted into diamond but remember at the end of the day a diamond is nothing but a compressed carbon so chemically speaking it's nothing but carbon now what is what is dh lawrence saying here it is simple you know to give the example of shakespeare shakespeare's hamlet he may be the prince of denmark but remember he is a human being so what shakespeare does here he is not to project a hamlet as a prince of denmark hamlet being a prince of denmark is uh, uh, not incidental to his character okay it lies outside his character but hamlet exhibits the vulnerabilities of a human being his to be or not to be it's my my to be or not to be also and you, it is yours too and what shakespeare has done here is to see the carbon beneath the diamond he may be a prince but he is a human being like you and me and therefore we find our own reflections in in hamlet and therefore we find our own reflections in a character like romeo or juliet so and therefore you know they may be presented as diamonds but what shakespeare does is to see the carbon beneath the diamond the human vulnerability the human emotions they feel like you romeo and juliet the juliet here in romeo and juliet she looks like a next door neighbor a girl who is living next door she may be uh, from an aristocratic background but she is as vulnerable as somebody who is next to you and therefore you know we feel for these characters and therefore shakespeare resonates even today so ladies and gentlemen here i rest my case thank you very much and what sir shakespeare was not of an age but for all the time as ben johnson applauded shakespeare sir talked on timelessness of shakespeare he emphasized 
on the aspect that new theories like feminism, Marxism, deconstruction, post-colonialism, or any other, their litmus test is Shakespeare. Sir so deliberated on how Shakespeare has its magical and remarkable influence on 17th, 18th, 19th, and even 20th century. Indeed, it was very informative and interesting session, sir. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation. I express a sense of gratitude to you on behalf of the host institutions. Thank you. Thank you Thank to you. all the participants for joining us in good numbers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.